Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome. <laughs> I don't know if you heard the last 10 minutes of anything I said, but i um, glad you guys are here. Uh, my name is Noji. This is Trevor. And we are very grateful to Trevor um, in his place, workplace for setting this up for us. And, and this has been just really, really nice for us. And I'm grateful that we can have this time to share with you um, during our club meeting. So welcome to the Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club May 2021 meeting. Um, and speaking of which, um, you will only have to endure this um, Zoom thing for a little while longer. We've been given the um, heads up by the city of Warm that we can someday soon return to in-person meetings in which we'll be able to mingle, have eyeball QSOs and, you know, uh, must be present to win prizes and so forth. Uh, looking forward to that for sure. And I will let you know, well, Trevor will probably let you know when that day is and, and when we can be sure we can meet in person. So until then, you know, keep your fingers crossed and we'll uh, look forward to it. At any rate, um, all right, I just got a couple of things. Normally I would have Carl um, announce these couple of things here, but I'll, he's, he's out of town right now. He can't even watch the Zoom, darn it. So I'll, I'll make the announcements for him. And number one, coming up on, on June 12th is the um, annual barbecue. This will be over at Highland Glen Park in, um, well, Highland. And um, the, the I don't know if a, a link to that has been posted yet or not, but anyway, if it's not, we'll do it after this meeting. But um, yeah, the, in Highland Glen Park, June 12th, it starts at 10 a.m. and it'll go to about 2, 2 p.m. is what we usually do. We, start to um, filter out of there by about two o'clock. But um, yeah, we're gonna have a, a lo boatload of chicken The chicken's provided. Uh, otherwise it's a potluck if you wanna bring something to share, um, a dessert, um, a salad, drink, any kind. I think there'll be drinks too, but feel free to bring stuff of your own. And, um, and let's see, there will, there will be door prizes there too. Um, if you'd like to contribute to a door prize, um, feel free to contact um, Carl or any, any of the other guys who are running the show, and they'll be glad to take your money. And if you don't, if you aren't careful, they will take your money. But um, also, we're going to have a, an HF station set up there with a couple of masks, and we're going to have a, um, um, a dual band dipole um, set up on 20 and 40, be, trying to be able to contact people all around the nation. And it'll be about noon time, and so that means we'll be Try our best to get on 20 meters and see what we can do on 40. But anyway, there you go. HF station under a little canopy. We'll see how that works. So that's June 12th, um, Highland Glen Park. Look for the link. Um, what else? We, oh, yeah, there's going to be a fox hunt in that too. So look forward to that. And if any of you guys want to go swimming, well, yeah, you can do that too in that pond. Uh, people were talking about catching fish there last time. So well, I guess you can do that too. Okay, another thing uh, also to announce is that um, because we will be meeting in person again someday soon, that we have secured a place finally for our ugly antenna contest. So this will be over in the um, Orem Friendship Center on 400 East and, and about, I don't know, 100 some odd north and change in Orem. And uh, we have no date for that yet because they haven't secured us a date when they can be sure we can meet without any kind of um, conflict in schedule. So that's going to be the ugly antenna contest. Looking forward to that. Don't know when, but we do know where now. So that's it. I know several people have already started making their antennas and they are ugly, believe me. So uh, I've seen a couple of them and they, they start to qualify. So if you want to enter the ugly antenna contest, please uh, let me know. Start making that antenna. Um, and um, and the winner of this ugly antenna contest has to have the ugliest and absolute. And we're going to have a couple of judges who will tell you that your antenna is ugly. Um, and the, the winner will receive an HF radio. Unfortunately, it won't be a brand new one. It'll be a used radio, but it'll still work. Um, if it doesn't work, we'll show you where to send you, where you can send it to get it repaired. Um, also, um, the ugly antenna contest, one of the criteria is that the, you have to be able to demonstrate that antenna actually works. So you have to be able to, to transmit with that antenna somewhere outside the current city block that we're on. <laughs> so a repeater works, you know, any, and any amateur band qualifies. So you can get on there and show us how it works. So pretty cool stuff. 
All right, I'm going to turn time over to Wendy now for activities. Go ahead, Wendy. All righty. Thank you so much, Noji. Um, I am activities coordinator for UVARC, and I want to just make an announcement regarding Utah Valley Amateur Field Day, which is sponsored by ARRL. It is going to be June 26th and 27th. And uh, we're going to be up at the, the strawberry site again. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We can get there early. Some people will show up Thursday, some people Friday. We do have porta potties, but it is uh, always a good idea to plan to bring plenty of water and your own food. We will be coordinating a potluck shortly for Friday, Saturday evening. And there's more information on our webpage, which is uvark.club field day information, <laughs> which uh, you're seeing now. So those are kind of some of the things that are happening. Um, we are looking for a volunteer to take up the communication trailer uh, it's just a small trailer that uh, is for the our uh, net that we so we can coordinate our uh, contacts during field day. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We do have a go to station there, and it's a rough camp. Any questions? Uh, uh, when would you need okay. the uh, comms trailer taken up? Uh, Friday evening, and then it would be back, brought back. Say we break down around noon. Uh, I I could probably do that. Uh, what what size uh, ball was on the? Does the hitch need? Let, let me back to G. Tell me. Yeah, it's a two inch ball. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, I've, who, I've got a two-inch ball on my truck. I can I can take that up, no problem. Awesome. Okay, and your name? Alex Markham, M-A-R-C-U-M. Okay. Thanks so much for ha for volunteering. And we'll turn it the time back over to Noji. Thank you very much, Wendy. And uh, um. I, I know this is Wendy's job. I shouldn't have probably saved this, but I forgot to mention that that, um, that we do have a swap meet coming up in September, don't we, Wendy? Yes, yes, we do. We do yeah. have a swap meet coming up in September. Again, on the calendar. Um, it's, tell me again when that is. I never can remember. It's sometime like the fall, like September. Yeah, it's the last Saturday in September. There you go. And it's going to be at the Spanish Fork uh, North Pavilion. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun where you can either sell stuff or buy stuff or meet new people. Yeah, we're expecting quite a lot of um, people show up because... Uh, no, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the Utah VHF Society swap meet was not able to take yeah, place. They come from all over, so that's a fun time in September. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, there, there are several swap meets around the state that have been canceled in the last year, and, and they haven't been able to meet for one reason or another, mostly because of indoor location and availability. So we were fortunate enough to be able to get the Spanish Park Pavilion. So, so that's why we were able to do this. So we look forward to it. We expect a lot of people to show up to kind of make for the lack of attendance at other prospective swap meets. So thank you very much, Wendy. And thank you for your work on that too. All right, so let's go ahead and turn the time over to Lauren, um, WB1KE, um, for our new and upgrade hands. All right, how's my audio, Noji? Wonderful. Excellent. All right, well, um, we have quite the list of new hams and upgrades tonight. And so I will try to read them off quickly. Um, new hams, we have Jared Barnes, Adam Evans, Stephen Ryant, Thomas McAdams, Darren Connors, Kobe Johnson, Leanne Johnson, 
Scott Jones, Stephanie Noyce, Judy Warwick, Rodney Newman, Mark Ellison, Yvonne Ellison, Laurel Hathcock, Kay Hauser, Beth Lee, Michael Reary, Catherine Scott, John Sermon, Dustin Spencer, Lacey Spencer, Sherry Wilkins, Elnathan Eldridge, Adrian Walker, David Walker, and Robert Black. So those are our new hams. Let's give them a hand. Yay. If I miss anybody, by the way, um, just uh, message me or Noji in the chat or whatever, and we'll make sure we get the missing person recognized. Um, for upgrades, we have Helaman Ferguson upgraded to extra, Michael Monson to general, Gary Hutton to general, Eric Pattison to general, Kiara Johnson to general, Deborah Hart to general, Jeff Rank to general, and Stan Erickson to general. So one extra and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven upgrades to general. So everybody, congratulations. Yay! And if you hear any of those new hams on the air and make sure you find out, see if you're their first contact and uh, fill out the first contact form for them so they get a nice um, recognition from ARRL. That commemorates their first contact. All right, Noji, um, back to you. All right, very good. Thank you, Lauren, very much. And, and according to the chat, there are a couple of people that, that we missed. It's not your fault, Lauren, it's my fault that I didn't send them to you. So Morgan Lindstrom, uh, got a praise in general. Um, and, um, and also Mike Monson to Extra. So congratulations to them too. And also Michelle Costello to General. Okay, I said an HBP, high blood pressure. <laughs> so good job, Michelle. Uh, and everybody who, who did that. Thank you so much, Lauren. Appreciate your time on that and your help. All right, let's turn the time over to Larry Jacob here for a minute. He's got an announcement he'd like to make. Uh, Larry, you on stage? <laughs> Yeah, I think I am. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Uh, so in a couple of days, it's going to be Saturday. And it's a special Saturday because it's the Worldwide Fox Hunt Weekend. Um, am I coming through okay? Yeah, perfectly. Yep. I can't hear you. You got your mask on. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, it's the uh, Worldwide Fox Hunt Weekend. And uh, I am putting together the Ofer State Wireless DX and Toaster Repair Society, which I am the president and king of. Um, we put together a fox hunt that has one main fox and five micro foxes in the same area. It's kind of like last year, only in different place. So don't sneak into the old place because we're not there. But we'll tell you it's in, uh, it's in the northern part of the county. It's uh, north of the Great Salt Lake. If you follow the signal into the lake itself, uh, it's not there. But it's in between those mountains that's on the east and the west side, you know those mountains? And it's uh, north of the lake, but not quite like to the prison. So that's the area it's gonna be in. It, it kicks off at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, I will be there personally harassing everybody. And uh, we'll be on 146.58 megahertz FM narrowband. And uh, uh, let's see, oh, there will be prizes, prizes for the first one to find me. And then when you find me, I'll give you a slip of paper that has the five other foxes and you just go off and try and find it and uh, put down the, uh, uh, the number that's on, on the top of the transmitter, bring it back. And if you're the first one to do that, I'll give you another prize. Uh, we're gonna try and shut it down about 12 o'clock uh, but if you know something, if somebody's looking for it, I'm going to stay there till they find it. So with that, uh, 146.58, nine o'clock Saturday morning. If you have an antenna, bring it. If you don't do body fading, because that has happened. And some of us have a body that fades better than others. Uh, so it, I've even had, uh, so one guy took grand prize with a paper clip one time, kind of embarrassing. Uh, I got about $800 worth of equipment there and he beat me out. So Back to you, appreciate it. Which lake is it north of? Uh, Utah Lake. Okay. That's the, I, that's I it. Utah Lake. <laughs> no, that, that's that green moldy one out there. Uh, okay. Okay, so it's north of the lake and in between those two mountains that have snow on the top. Uh -huh. 
I'm glad you clarified that. That narrows it down a bit. Well, and you know, it's a good thing to you, Larry, that the, the fox is not located in the lake. So we're, we're grateful for that. I do have, I do have some uh, uh, waterproof transmitters we used with the Coast Guard to find vessels that were sinking. So, hey, you know, if you guys want to do that, I, I'm up for it also. Hey, you never know. That, that could come in handy. Thank you, Larry, very much. All right, and, and uh, watching on the chat, by the way, we did uh, what so I neglected to mention of, of all people, uh, Joe Costello got upgraded to extra two. And I don't know how you missed my list, but, but Joe, congratulations to you on your um, uh, advancement, promotion, whatever to extra. So congratulations on that. And let's see, who else did I miss there? Um, da, 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 da. It looks like I probably got everybody, but at any rate. Okay, thanks, appreciate that. All right, well, let's see. I think that's gonna do it. So, uh, I ain't got anything else covered. All right, Keith, you ready for this? Ready to rock and roll? All right, Keith, if you're ready, the mic is yours. I'm sorry, <clears throat> working on sharing my screen. Everybody hear me okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Let me check a couple of things first because I've got a couple of elements in here. Can uh, can you see the little uh, telegraph key banging away? Yep. Okay, and. Here's the CW. So I got my audio shared okay? Yeah, yeah okay. we're all set. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay, <clears throat> so this is uh, something I've had kicking around in my head for a while. And as I, you know, I, I started out years ago, uh, uh, um, even before I was a ham, back in my uh, <clears throat> CB days, and uh, playing with antennas. And so um, as, I, as I went along learning more and more and more, I discovered that the, almost every antenna that you'll ever see has a common element. And that common element is, okay, come on, why is the keyboard not working? Almost every uh, antenna has in its guts a dipole. And so we're going to start by talking a little bit about dipoles and how they work and, and uh, some of the characteristics and what makes them go and so on. And then we'll go on into a, a bunch of different other types of antennas and see if we can figure out how they are a variation on a dipole and why they're a variation and so on. Um, <clears throat> so... Here's the, here, here's the lowly dipole, the heartbeat of your antenna. And I know this is a really busy animation. Is it moving for everybody? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. So you can see that the, the, in black is the, is the dipole. Down there, the little uh, R is the source for the dipole. So that's, the, that's coming from your transmitter. And you can see as, as it uh, feeds a, a, uh, uh, an alternating current into your uh, dipole, we have alternate positive and negative fields that uh, pile up on either end of the dipole, positive in red and the negative in, in blue. <clears throat> and as it does this, the uh, the electrons as they're moving back and forth in the dipole create a, uh, a field and they, they create both an electric field, often known as the, eight, as the E field, and they create a magnetic field at right angles to that. So the, the electric field is shown here in, in green. The H field, or the magnetic field is shown here in pink. And I, I don't really like the way they did it in this diagram, but 
it kind of get it shows you that they are at right angles to one another and they feed off of one another as one side is is uh, growing the other side's collapsing and so on okay so that's basically what makes an antenna work it's this movement of electrons within the dipole portion of the antenna okay um, let's move on to the next topic. And you can't really talk about antennas without talking about impedance and the related um, aspect called SWR or VSWR. And so I'm just gonna briefly explain impedance and, uh, and hopefully we can shed some light on that because it is kind of a mysterious thing. So impedance is the effective resistance of an electric circuit component to alternating current arising from the combined effects, and that's important, of ohmic resistance, just the resistance of the wire in your dipole, for example, and reactance. And reactance comes into play when the dipole is not perfectly matched to the frequency that uh, um, that uh, you're operating on, okay? Um, and I'm gonna skip one slide here and then come back to it in a second. Okay, <clears throat> I wanna bring this home, this idea of impedance home to, uh, to uh, help you understand how, how it works. What you see on the screen is a pair of bicycles and everybody's ridden a bicycle, I assume. Um, and most everybody has ridden a bicycle that has gears on it, okay? So imagine a bicycle, we're riding along happily on the flat and, it's, and, and our legs and body are producing power that are then transferred through the chain to the rear wheel. The rear wheel pushes against the road and forward we go, okay? Now we come along to a, a hill and we start going uphill and all of a sudden it gets really hard to pedal. So we shift gears, okay? And uh, let me turn on my, uh, my little uh, laser pointer here. And we can see when we've shifted gears, we can see that our foot as it's pushing the pedal down, moves the same distance as it did before, but the amount of force generated is, is different. And that's because all of a sudden, when we were in the low gear for every, and in this example, 15 centimeters of push on the pedal produced um, 34 centimeters of forward motion. Now, as we go up the hill, and I, I've got this in reverse, uh, uh, the, in the low gear, in the high gear, when we were on the flat, <clears throat> 15 centimeters of push on the pedal produced 68 centimeters of forward motion. As we shifted into a lower gear to go up the hill, 15 centimeters of push on the pedal produces 34 centimeters. And all we're really doing is we are changing the relative impedance of the bicycle's forward motion. Okay, now let me go back one thing and clarify something as it, re as it applies to radio. In any system where you have a source of power and a transmission line and a load, the most efficient power transfer happens when the impedances all match. In radio, for most of us, that would be a 50 ohm source in our radio matches our 50 ohm coax, and that matches a 50 ohm load antenna. If those all match up, we get the most efficient transfer of power uh, to, from the source to the load. Now, this particular diagram is showing a coax for that, but it could be a uh, ladder line or, uh, um, or twin lead or some other type of feed line. And in reality, the impedances could be different. 
For example, in FM radio, they typically use 75 ohms for their standard. Um, but regardless, if, they, if the impedances all match, that's where we get the most efficient power transfer from the source, which is our radio, our transmitter, to the antenna, okay? Now let's move on to this plot. This is uh, almost our last one with, you know, I've got like three or four more with regard to impedance, but they're more simple. The concepts we've covered are the most important ones. When we start plotting, um, the standing wave ratio, that's what SWR stands for, uh, and the impedance with regard to an antenna and frequency, we typically find out that the bandwidth of an antenna um, covers a certain frequency range, okay? And typically we define that as being everything below two to one standing wave ratio. Now I need to explain what standing wave ratio is. What that means, in this case, here's a two to one point. That means that the impedance of the antenna is either twice or half of what the, our transmitter is expecting. So for a 50 ohm transmitter, this might either be 100 ohms or it might be 25 ohms. And same thing on the other side, 100 ohms or 25 ohms. And in a typical antenna scenario where we've got a, a certain bandwidth that it's covered, usually one of them will be the 100 ohm uh, point and the other one will be the 25 ohm point. It just, it depends on the frequency. And you can see in this particular antenna, it is tuned for, you know, right around 14.1 megahertz and has a one-to-one -one SWR at that point, okay? Now let's, uh, let's see why that is. <clears throat> when you feed an, a, uh, an antenna with a particular frequency, if there is any mismatch between the antenna and the source and feed line impedance, you will get a reflection. So in this diagram, you can see the red forward signal that is coming from our transmitter headed towards the antenna. And then it hits the end of the antenna. And if there's a mismatch, you get a reflection. That's the blue um, sine wave that you can see going back the other direction. Now, why do they call it standing wave? Well, <clears throat> those two waves, the one going forward and the one going backwards will meet at some point and they, uh, they add to one another. And you can see they'll go from, they, they actually will, can produce a voltage and current nodes that are greater than the original amount of power, okay? Let's uh, go on and talk about why that's important. If we've got power that is reflecting off of our antenna, that means it's not getting radiated in the antenna, okay? It's going back towards the transmitter. Um, and on this diagram, you can see that as the standing wave ratio goes up from one to one, where the, the amount of power being returned is, the amount of power being, uh, being radiated by the antenna is the same as the source. In other words, the return loss is infinite. There's no loss. Um, the percent of power loss is zero. The reflection coefficient is zero. And the mismatch loses in the process, zero dB, okay? As we get down to two to one, we can see that we're losing almost 10 dB having being returned, okay? Uh, that's 11% reflection coefficient of uh, 0.333 or a third. And the, the loss becomes 0.51 dB. But as we go up higher and we hit a complete mismatch 
beyond a hundred, uh, a hundred one, you know, if we get infinity to one, that means that nothing is going into the antenna. It's all being reflected. And the loss is of course, infinite. Okay. You can, you can Google and find this chart um, uh, online. Okay. Back to our dipole. We're done talking heavy duty about impedance. So everybody, everybody who has gone to sleep can wake up now. Um, let's talk about a dipole that we string out in our backyard. And um, let's talk about the feed point impedance of that dipole. We always talk about our radio being 50 ohms and the dipole is 50 ohms and the feed line is 50 ohms. But in reality, that depends. And in this, this, ex, this thing we're talking, this section, we're talking about the dipole being differing heights above the ground, okay? That uh, um, a dipole in free space, the impedance is, is about 73 ohms, which means if we put that dipole out there, we have it high enough that it's considered to be in free space above a one a wavelength above the ground, we're going to see close to a two to one SWR coming uh, in, as the impedance or the the SWR coming back to our uh, um, our transmitter. Okay, because the impedance of a dipole is about seventy three ohms, but that's not consistent. It's not always seventy three ohms. It's not always fifty ohms. As we start about you know an eighth of a wavelength above the ground, a very low antenna, it's something on the order of 30 or 50 or 30 or 40 ohms. As we get up, we go past the 50 ohm point, we get up to a quarter wave above the ground, and uh, that's going to be you know something on the 80 on the order of 80 or 90 ohms. We go up as far as 100 ohms at a quarter wavelength. Then it comes back down to a half a half wavelength above the ground. We're back down closer to 50 ohms, but not quite, and so on, to where it eventually, as we get more than a wavelength above the ground, it evens out at about 73 ohms with our with our dipole in free space. Okay, so we can't really say you know in all cases that a dipole is gonna match our 50 ohm transmitter. So what do we do about it? Well, often we use, we, do, we add something to the system, to match the transmitter to the, to the antenna system. And often you'll find dipoles that are, commercial dipoles that are shipped with uh, what's known as a balland, or in the case of a, um, um, uh, one designed for uh, coax and uh, anyway, you can have either a balun or an un un. A balun means it's converting not only the impedance, but it's also converting from a balanced feed line to, or from a balanced antenna to an unbalanced feed line. Um, in the case of an un un, it is unbalanced to unbalanced. Okay. So you'll often see, you know, they'll ship it in and they'll, they'll use a, uh, like a four to one uh, ballon or something like that, okay? Another way to do that is with an antenna tuner or, or sometimes calls it transmatch. And they're a variable um, uh, transformer that can transform a wide range of impedance, antenna impedances to our uh, 50 ohm transmitter, okay? And they come in a variety of different sizes and shapes. Some of them are designed to be weatherproof to put out right at the antenna so that you don't suffer feed line losses from the uh, mismatch. Uh, some of them are designed to sit right with an antenna. Some HF, modern HF rigs have a uh, antenna tuner built in. <clears throat> but regardless, the purpose is to change the impedance of the, basically change the impedance of the transmitter to whatever the antenna needs, to whatever the impedance of the antenna is, okay? Now we've talked about um, an 
an antenna at varying heights above the ground, okay? But there are other things that um, affect the antenna and its impedance. Um, we talked about height above the ground. Also coming into play is the type of ground, okay? Are we on a, uh, a beach near the ocean where there's lots of salt water and sand? Are we on, uh, are we out on the, the sand dunes, you know, uh, where everything is dry and sandy? Are we out in the forest near a stream where it's wet? What types of minerals are in the ground? All of this will affect uh, the dipole antenna above it and how well it um, stay, sticks to the rules that I told a little while ago of its impedance over certain wavelengths above the ground. It all changes and it depends on the type of ground. Other things that affect that antenna impedance and its gain, and which we'll talk about in a minute, its pattern, which is related, and ultimately the performance of the dipole are, uh, you know, what's nearby? Is it hung from a tower? Are there trees nearby? Are there nearby buildings? Are, are the, is it over the top of the roof of, an, of a building? You know, are there fences? Are those fences wood? Are they metal? Are they plastic? Uh, what other structures are around? Are there are there wires strung in the vicinity? Are there power wires, cable TV, uh, telephone wires, um, anything that is conductive that is in the neighborhood, meaning within about a wavelength of the antenna is going to affect the impedance and the pattern and the gain of that antenna, okay? Uh, also antennas can get wet uh, have snow on them, uh, ice, that will affect it as well. You'll find that maybe your antenna tunes up rather nicely and operates very well in the summer, but in the winter, in the winter when there's been an ice storm or a snowstorm, all of a sudden snow piles on top of that antenna and uh, it doesn't work anymore. And you wonder why, you scratch your head. So anyway, another thing that will affect it is as we, if, if, if we have a basic dipole and it's tuned for a specific frequency, if we move our frequency to one end of the band or the other or to a different band, that's going to affect the dipole as well. And all, everything changes. Okay, I've got a little video um, that uh, I wanna play that uh, kind of characterizes how most of my antenna installations work. So, Let's go to that and
And in the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward this a little bit. if I offended anybody with that, but I thought it was funny, kind of how my installation, antenna installations go. Okay, so follow on to that is almost every antenna installation is a compromise. Unless you're one of these guys out in the Midwest that's got hundreds of acres of ground and um, perfect soil underneath and uh, all the money in the world to put up towers and uh, and so on, you're going to have to compromise. And that's just the way the world of antennas is. Okay. So. That sounds more like a marriage than an antenna. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. We've talked about antenna height, but I also want to talk about antenna pattern. And this is important. Since every, since every uh, installation is a, uh, is a compromise, um, let's start with our dipole in free space, okay? So this is a dipole that's hung um, more than a one wavelength above the ground. And you can see it has a nice even donut pattern to it, okay? Um, the dipole is, is this kind of tan colored part here. And then as you get go from blue to red, the signal strength gets stronger. So that's a, that's a basic dipole. Now look at, let's look at one hung variety of wavelength above the ground. And the reason I talk about this is because how high you want to hang your dipole depends on what you want to do with it. If you want to talk to the local guys out to, you know, say a uh, couple of hundred to a thousand miles, you don't want your dipole very high. You want it maybe a quarter wavelength above the ground, okay? And you get a nice, uh, nice even pattern, but most of the en energy is going up. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. If I string my, my dipole a little higher, all of a sudden, very little energy is going up. And most of it is going out to medium range stations. We're going to get you know, short range stations, not going to work very well. Okay. Medium range works pretty good, but long DX say to Europe is going to kind of work, but not as well. Okay. If we go up to three quarters of a wavelength, we get back some of our local, we get some longer distance ones, but the medium range suffers. Okay go up to a wavelength above the ground, and all of a sudden we get medium range comes back. DX range is good because we've got these lobes that are aimed towards the horizon, but our short range 
doesn't work as well because not as much is going straight up. So how high you, they always tell you, you know, string your dipole so high. Well, it depends on what you want to do with it. If I want to talk to Europe, you know, I'm going to want to put it one wavelength above the ground. If I want to talk, you know, if I want to use the, the 80 meter band to uh, check into the statewide races net, or if I want to check into the beehive net every day on 40 meters, I may want to put my dipole at a quarter wavelength above the ground. It just depends on what you want to do. Another thing you might notice is that these uh, patterns are not omnidirectional in the, uh, in the azimuth uh, direction. So you've got, to, you've got to orient your dipole to put most of its energy in the direction that you want, okay? Um, now, what do we call it when we've got more energy going in a particular direction? That's called gain. If you've ever, um, ever bought a commercial antenna, they'll advertise it has so much gain. Well, of course, that depends. How much gain it has depends on where and how high you hang it and what things are in the uh, what things are in the near field and so on. Uh, it's uh, it's you know just um, it, it just depends on how you uh, orient everything. Okay. Now you may think, okay, I want to talk to Europe. I'm going to arrange my dipole completely north and south. Well, this is what's called an azimuth map. And if you look at this, you'll notice that uh, Europe is not directly east of Utah. This particular map was calculated based on my home location in Orem. So if I wanna, if I wanna orient my antenna to talk to Europe, I've gotta aim it Northeast. If I wanna talk to South Africa, east, directly East would be the way. If I want to talk to Antarctica, you know, south, but south, e south by southeast and south by southwest are good choices. If I want to talk to Australia, you know, I would orient it towards the west, southwest, and so on. Okay. So um, we talked about gain. That's just that's just energy that is going in a particular direction rather than being fully om omnidirectional, okay? So how can we know, given all of these zillion variables, how can we know what our antenna is gonna do? Well, one way is to use antenna modeling software, okay? But, and this is a big but, you have to understand the limitations of the software. If you want to take into account the fence that's around your yard, that chain link fence, then you've got to put it into the model. If you want to take into account that, uh, um, that aluminum uh, uh, rain gutter around your house's roof, you've got to put it in the model. The, uh, the antenna modeling software without all of those other variables is going to just tell you what's going on with the antenna in free space. So keep that in mind. But now that I've uh, convinced you all that it's not, you know, that everything is, is a bummer and, and things aren't going to work the way we want, let's take some of this and, and uh, change things up on the antenna and use it to our advantage. Because in my particular case, I don't have room for a, a, a long dipole, a super long dipole. I need to fit it into my city lot. So we might want to change uh, our dipole to fit into the existing real estate. We might want to change the feed point. Some of you have a nice tall tree out at the other end of your lot, but it's not convenient to run a feed line out to the middle of a dipole. Maybe you want to uh, uh, feed it somewhere closer to where your shack is. Um, maybe we want to operate on all of a given frequency band so we want to widen the range of frequency on our dipole. We may want to operate on, on multiple bands. 
then we may want to, as we talked earlier, we may want to change the radiation pattern so that our dipole talks to Europe instead of uh, only to uh, uh, St. George, for example. Um, so we might want to increase the gain in a particular direction. And that's important when you say increased gain, because when you're increasing gain on an, on an antenna, all you're doing is steering the energy in a particular direction. You're not getting energy for free. You're not getting um, radiated stre signal strength for free. You're taking it from somewhere and putting it where you want it, okay? Um, we also may wanna change the, the polarization of our antenna because there's a um, uh, horizontal antennas and vertical antennas um, in the near field don't talk real well to each other. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a many dB hit between a horizontal and a vertical. And the talking about that much more is kind of beyond the scope of this little talk. Okay. So having said all that, let's go dipole hunting. We're done with all the theory. We're done with all the talk talk. Let's look at a bunch of antennas and see if we can identify what in that antenna is a dipole. Okay. First of all, you've all probably got one of these and you probably don't think about it being a dipole, but it is. You've got the rubber duct that's sticking up out of the top. That's half of your dipole. Where's the other half? It's the radio itself and your body, your hand, your arm, what have you, as uh, acting as the other half of that dipole. Okay. Well, Unfortunately, the radios, modern radios are kind of short. They're not long enough to make a good quarter wavelength on two meters. Um, so there are some things that we can do to improve that. And uh, Ham's long time figured out that if I actually put the other half of the dipole on there and not try to use the radio as the other half of the dipole, it works better. So you basically take a piece of wire hook it to a ground on the radio and um, let it dangle as the other quarter wavelength of your dipole, okay? We talked about having a uh, antenna support at the other end of the yard, but that's not convenient for a center fed dipole. So here's an end fed half wave, still a dipole, it's half wave length long, We've just moved the feed point from the center off to the end. Now, one thing that uh, that does to us though, is it really changes the feed point impedance. The imp feed point impedance of, a, of an end fed half wave is somewhere in the range of 3000 to 5000 ohms, very high impedance, okay? That's why they will often put a, uh, an unun, and in this case, it's a it's showing a nine to one unun that takes our feed point impedance from that 5,000 ohms down to closer to 500, which is a 10 to one SWR instead of a thousand to one, and brings it in a range that our antenna tuner can tune it down to the 50 ohms that our radio is expecting. Okay, so that's uh, that's one of the things that uh, that we can do with the uh, uh, an antenna. Um, let me uh, hang on a second. I got to get to the next. Uh, sorry, the next one. A related type of antenna is what's known as a long wire. It's a wire that's longer than a half wavelength, but we back it up with a non-trivial, really good antenna tuner that can handle a wide range of impedance mismatches and we hook it to our radio. Um, because we're using a really good antenna tuner, this antenna will often tune not only across a full band, but maybe other bands as well. So we can use it as a multi-band antenna. Um, the radiation pattern will be different on every band. We know that, we expect it and uh, but it lets us make some contacts with just a piece of wire strung out to a tree or a pole or whatever you happen to have handy. 
Another way to go on multiple bands, and you may have heard of these, is a multi-band fan dipole, where you literally create multiple dipoles, one for each band, and feed them from a common feed point, okay? And this works very well. A lot of hams use them. Question comes up, do I have to neatly align them up uh, in order like this one is? The answer is no. Um, here's what a ham in the Midwest did. You can see this, each dipole is a different color and he strung a, a carrier line between a tree and his tall tower and then strung the various dipoles off in random directions just to whatever trees he happened to have available. And he had a, an antenna that would operate on all bands, uh, albeit with very different radiation patterns, um, but it got him on the air on all bands. So that's kind of a, kind of a cool use of a fan dipole. Um, another way to go multi-band is to build all of those dipoles into a single um, dipole using what's, what are called traps. And in this case, we have a set of coils that are spaced along the, the uh, uh, legs of the dipole. And on the low bands, like 40 meters, these traps here, this one, and this one, and this one kind of disappear. They let the 40 meter signal go through and we use the full length of the antenna. When we move to 20 meters, this trap all of a sudden becomes a, uh, uh, an open to the, uh, to, the 20 meters, or to the 20 meter signal so that we only use this portion of the dipole uh, and so on with the 15 meter trap, the 10 meter trap, and you could add you know, a six meter trap if you wanted to and so on. Um, so, that's another way that we can uh, um, make, our, uh, make our dipole operate on multiple bands. Okay. We talked about spreading our, uh, making our dipole operate uh, over a wide range of frequencies, say an entire band or rather than a portion of a band. And one, one way to do that is to make the, uh, make the elements big and fat. When you do that, it lowers the Q of the antenna and the antenna will operate over a much wider frequency range before the SWR climbs beyond that magic two to one point that makes it uh, not as usable. The picture on the right is kind of hard to pick out, but this is a picture of a Russian radar. Uh, you've heard of the over horizon radar. That's what this antenna is. And it is a series of fat dipoles uh, laid out in an array to concentrate the signal in one direction to make a low band, low frequency uh, uh, radar. Okay. Another way to uh, uh, operate on multiple bands, you notice in this dipole, the legs are no longer symmetrical. One leg is longer than the other. Some hams have figured out that if you move the impedance or move the feed point of the antenna so that it's not right in the center, you can get a low SWR on multiple ham bands. And that's what the purpose of an off center fed dipole. I think these are often called a Wyndham. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the Wyndhams but, usually have a radiating feed line as well. Okay, okay. Um, anyway, uh, a wind, but a Wyndham is an off center fed dipole, right? That is correct. Okay, okay. So I wasn't completely off in the weeds. Okay, good. Uh, let's see, what have we got next? Uh, I mentioned earlier that I like to uh, check into the Beehive net and I like to check into the statewide races net. And in that case, most of the stations are relatively local they're within you know a couple hundred miles and so i use a dipole that is low to the ground and uh, operates in what's called nivis mode nvis 
stands for Near Vertical Incident Skywave. The idea is you aim your signal straight up and it bounces off the ionosphere and comes more or less straight back down, scattering somewhat into the surrounding areas. It lets you talk to Salt Lake and Davis County and St. George and, and uh, around the state, but it uh, is definitely not a, a great DX antenna. It uh, would not talk to Europe very well, would not talk to the East Coast very well, but uh, works gangbusters around the Intermountain West. Okay. Here's an example for 40 and 80 meters that is a Nivis antenna. You can see that it's only at the apex is only 15 feet high. And so it's very low to the ground. Uh, it's in a, uh, um, it's, it's basically a fan dipole for 80 and 40 meters, but it's low to the ground and in a uh, uh, inverted V configuration, which basically makes it omnidirectional but most of the energy is going straight up, okay? So there's your Nivis antenna. What if we live on a lot and we want to put up a regular dipole, but we just don't have enough space? One way to do that is to, is to take the ends of that and fold them back towards the center and make what's called a folded dipole. And there are various ways of doing that, uh, various ways of, uh, you can only, you can only get the two sides, folded sides, um, so close together before they start acting like one wire, and then you're on a uh, uh, on a you've got your dipole for a higher frequency band, but it stops working on the frequency band that it was originally designed for. So anyway, a folded dipole. Um, here's one that's been a favorite of hams for a long time, especially for receive antennas. This is where we take our dipole and we duplicate it on the other side and create a complete full wave loop, okay? Put it a certain height above the ground. And this has, depending on how high you put it, has excellent, uh, can either have excellent Nivis properties or excellent DX properties. One of the things that's nice about it also, it's a very quiet antenna. Uh, it's quite immune to uh, local noise. Um, and so you'll, uh, you can often hear very well the distant station um, and, and have less noise so that your signal to noise ratio is, is better. Um, these can also be operated with a tuner across multiple bands. Okay. So we've talked about HF antennas mostly here, but all, all of this stuff that we've been talking about also applies at VHF and UHF, okay? So say we wanna make a dipole for two meters. Well, if we're talking about FM, the FM portion of which is most of the two meter band, um, we want that to be vertically polarized. So here's a vertical two meter dipole where uh, we basically, it's just a, still a center fed dipole and we've just stuck it out far enough from the mast that the mast doesn't uh, interfere as much. And uh, we have a, uh, you know, a, a, a vertical half wave antenna. Another way of doing that is to take our feed line and run it up the center of one of the dipole elements. This is called a coaxial vertical. And basically what you do is you take a piece of coax, strip it back a quarter of a, a quarter wave without cutting the, the, the coax braid. And then you fold the braid back over the top of the rest of the coax. And it makes a center fed dipole with the coax running up the middle of one of the elements. You might find that this is very similar to a good old favorite, which is just quarter wave ground plane. Where's our dipole here? Well, we've got our quarter wave element and then we've taken the other half of the dipole and we've um, arranged it out in various radials uh, to act as the, uh, the, other, uh, the other half of the uh, dipole, okay? 
here's one that's very popular for mobiles. Uh, and uh, I have one on my car, it works extremely well. It's basically an end-fed half-wave uh, dipole with an additional eighth wave added to it. And what that additional eighth wavelength does is it lowers the endpoint impedance, which you remember for an end-fed half-wave that impedance is 3,000 to 5,000 ohms. This lowers it quite a bit such that a small coil down at the base can match it to a 50 ohm coax, okay? It does require a ground plane below it in order to work properly, okay? Here's another popular way of getting a, a uh, half wave vertical. Um, at first glance, you'd say, wait, this isn't half wave, it's a half plus a quarter wave, but not really. Turns out that this right here, this last quarter wave is an impedance matching device. And it's like a balanced feed line um, where the right side and the left side uh, are operated out of phase and cancel each other out. They, in the process, transform the impedance such that you can feed that end fed half wave above it. Still a half wave antenna, just with a matching section. Okay. Another popular one that uh, we've seen around here a lot. Anybody recognize this? Carl's J Paul. I got one on my roof. Yeah, a lot of us do. Um, turns out that this is also this is a J Paul designed for two different bands, and you can see the feed point is right here. Um, it's got a quarter wave matching section. Okay, but actually, this is the two meter element that goes on up, and it's three quarters wavelength long. This is a quarter wavelength on two meters, and this is the matching section right here. But when you switch to 70 centimeters, all of a sudden, just like in a fan dipole, this element disappears, and we have a quarter wave matching section here on 70 centimeters and a half wave on, on 70 centimeters going up. So again, it's like a combination between a fan dipole and a, uh, and a J-pole. And they work quite well. Hey, Keith? Yeah. If I'm aiming that so that I can hit a particular repeater, do I want to line those up in a straight line pointing to the repeater, or do I want them at a 90-degree angle to the repeater? Um, it doesn't matter. That quarter wave section at the bottom is not part of the radiate is not a radiating element of the antenna. Sorry, I hit the wrong key on the keyboard and things went wacky for a minute there. So I've actually seen these where there's a 90 degree angle right here. Oh, you probably don't see that because I lost my. Uh, but on car there. on Carl's, it's completely circle pattern. Yeah, let me let me. Yep, it's a it's a uh, it's a flat donut. OK. OK. Thanks. So no, you don't have to light them up any particular direction. They uh, they radiate in all uh, all of, uh, directions horizontally, you know, going out from the antenna. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What have I got next here? What's my next slide? Okay. Let's. Uh, boy, my keyboard goes wonky on me. So here's an interesting one. This is a very popular antenna on in uh, from two meters and above, especially on 70 centimeters and so on, um, because this is this is a very directional antenna. Uh, you have a driven dipole in the center, and then what amounts to uh, reflectors. This gives you a, a direct, this gives you a, a pattern that goes off in one direction quite well. And you can orient it either vertically or horizontally. This one is horizontal. The one on the right is a vertical. Um, and, uh, and they work very, very well. You get about 180 degrees of pattern. And so you take 
these are, these are very popular for like people that live up on a hillside and they don't want to spend half their energy warming up the hillside. So they put up a reflect corner reflector and aim it towards out towards the valley. We had a repeater up on uh, um, Dixon Peak at the south end of the valley for many years and it was a UHF repeater. And this is the type of antenna we used on it. And boy, did it talk across the valley gangbusters. It was great. Okay, let's move on. Um, another type of vertical antenna. This is our old fashioned, our old friend, the quarter wave uh, ground plane. But before we hit the ground plane, we've added additional half wave elements. And you notice that they're alternating. These are made from coax and they're alternating. Every half wave, we switch the, uh, the shield with the center conductor. And what that does is it makes these half wave elements operate in phase with one another. And so you get a lot of gain towards the horizon. Um, and I've seen these built, uh, you can find plans online with as many as eight half wave elements. Um, and they, uh, they work very, very well. Um, I don't know if any of you have uh, like a, a, a diamond or a comet vertical. Um, they work in a very similar way, except for instead of uh, having coax and swapping the ends, they use phasing coils in midstream to, uh, to create multiple elements on top of one another. Okay, let's figure out where I am. Okay, here's one that's very popular with the commercial radio crowd. It's called a vertical folded dipole array. And you can see we've got a folded, we've got folded dipoles for whatever band we're interested in. And we stack them one on top of each other so that their signals add together as they're transmitting. And there's a phasing harness in here that allows you to adjust the phase of each of these elements and you can actually steer the signal like for an antenna like this you can put it on a mountaintop and then steer the signal down towards the valley so that it has some down tilt to it um, this one on the right they've used four elements but instead of putting them um, all uh, in a collinear fashion They've put two of them side by side on top of two of them side by side. Um, and this gets you some gain in two directions out towards the horizon. It would have a, a pattern more like a, like a figure eight rather than a, a circle. Okay. Now I talked about in this on the one on the left about phasing the different elements. Well, you can actually take that to extreme and add a phasing uh, um, device in for each element, add a controller, and then you can steer the uh, um, signal in whatever direction you want, up or down. And you can see that even though all of these dipole elements are in line with one another, the signal has been steered upwards in this case. That's kind of an interesting thing. Um, now, if you have all the money in the world, like the US military has, you can take that to the ultimate extreme. And you can see this is a massive folded dipole array with phasing elements that they can steer that signal anywhere they want it to go within you know, the limits of they're not gonna steer it behind them. Okay, let's just turn the truck around for that. Okay, here's another example of an antenna that uses uh, phasing to steer the antenna. Now this isn't a ham antenna, just like the military one isn't a ham antenna. This is a, a navigation beacon. And if any of you have ever driven up on top of Lake Mountain, you'll know that there is one up there. That's the Fairfield VOR and is used for radio navigation for aircraft. Uh, across much of the Intermountain West. 
Um, the way it works is it changes the phase of each of these elements around the antenna and literally rotates the signal in a, through 360 degrees in a circle um, and it does it 30 times a second. The unit also transmits a second signal that uh, is a reference signal. When the aircraft picks this up, it notices when the signal passed its antenna, what phase it was at and how, how that related to the reference phase. And it can tell what direction it is from that antenna. Um, being a private pilot, I've used these many, many times and uh, they work pretty well. Okay, let's move back into the amateur wordle a little bit. Uh, you guys have probably seen this type of antenna, commonly known as a Yagi. Um, the full name is actually Yagi Uda, was developed by uh, two, uh, two, uh, pr two uh, professors working at the uh, university in Tokyo. No, actually, I think it was in Kyoto. Anyway. See, you can tell I'm lying when my lips move. Um, and what they figured out is that by having a single driven element dipole, putting a second passive dipole behind it of a particular length and distance, adding more passive dipoles in front, they could make these passive dipole elements um, receive and re-radiate the signal. And by changing the length between them and the length of the dipole elements, they could make the signal add up such that it leaves the antenna, all of them in phase and um, have the uh, signal behind the antenna be destructively interfered with and you, uh, you, they're all out of phase and therefore uh, have much less signal. So you end up with a signal directed in one direction. Uh, an interesting bit of trivia, trivia going back to Yagi and Uda. The actual designer was Uda. Yagi um, published a paper about this and put his own name on it and uh, uh, left Uda's name off and it ever since it's been known as just a Yagi, but uh, the real designer was Uda, not Yagi. There you go, trivia for the night. Um, another bit of uh, trivia is that the driven element because of these phased um, uh, passive reflectors and directors usually has an impedance a little bit below 50 ohms. It's more like four, 10 to 40 ohms. And so usually you have to use a some sort of impedance matching device on there. And they name them using Greek letters. You can have a, uh, a delta feed or a, a lambda feed or a what have you, a gamma match. Um, but uh, regardless, that purpose of that is just to uh, adjust the feed point impedance to 50 ohms. And you may, see, you may have seen a common uh, uh, implementation of that around um, tape measure Yagi. Um, I built one the other day just for fun, just, just because I had a tape measure and I had some uh, PVC pipe. Um, so there's a three element, two meter Yagi, very cheap to build, very easy to build. And uh, it can get you some good gain and good front to back ratio for, uh, for the DX, uh, for the fox hunt. At the, uh, at the party up there in Highland. Okay, let's move on. This next one is called a log periodic dipole array. Uh, log standing for logarithmic. Um, and you can see that the elements are, uh, are different lengths um, in a logarithmic fashion. And the way this works is it's basically a combination of elements from a fan dipole and a Yagi antenna. They operate over a very high, a very wide range of frequencies and with, with yet with the gain nearing, approaching that of a, uh, of a Yagi antenna. 
And the way they do it is um, <clears throat> just like in a fan dipole, the signal picks the element that is closest to its uh, correct impedance and uses that element. The, the uh, element in front is a little shorter, so it acts like a director at a Yagi. The element behind is a little longer, so it acts like a reflector. And so basically you have a, 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 a Yagi that has some of the characteristics of a fan dipole, kind of a cool antenna. Um, let's see, let's, let's move on again, uh, away from the hand bands for just a moment um, and talk about uh, an antenna that uh, most of you have in your pocket right now. And that's in your cell phone or uh, in your laptop or in any other Wi-Fi enabled device. We have what are called micro strip or patch antennas that are literally part of the circuit board, but they're cut to a specific length and width in order to resonate uh, on the frequency bands of interest. Uh, in cell phones, that's usually up in the microwave region, um, 1900 megahertz, uh, 3.4 gigahertz, if you're talking cell phone 5G and so on, okay? Um, sometimes they look like this, where you've got, this is the antenna feed point You've got a chip that's feeding uh, the RF. It's got a little matching section like an antenna tuner and that feeds out into this, uh, tr just a, it's just a trace on the circuit board and becomes your antenna. On the right, you can see a uh, micro strip uh, log periodic, which is kind of interesting. Okay, moving on. Uh, this, was, this is an antenna that's popular in the microwave bands and popular with the uh, uh, guys that do uh, long distance point to point Wi-Fi. Uh, some of the mesh guys like to use this type of antenna. Um, it's called a cantenna and has quite a bit of gain um, and is very directional. But again, here's our old friend, the dipole. There's a quarter wave, wavelength active element a quarter wavelength back to the back of the can, which is just reflecting, and a full three quarter wavelength, so a half wave wavelength in front of the uh, driven element, and a half wavelength aperture. And so these are kind of popular, uh, like I said, with the, with the Wi Fi and mesh crowd. Okay. Now I promised at the beginning of this that I would go from uh, dipoles to dishes and so there's your dish turns out that the only active portion of this dish is right here in the feed horn okay the dish is just a reflector just like the reflector behind your uh, bulb in a flashlight and it just uh, directs the energy all off in one direction um, they can be offset they don't have to be aimed directly at the center this gets the feed horn out of the way of the uh, reflecting element. This is popular with the uh, satellite uh, crowd, but also uh, uh, some of the point-to-point -point microwave crowd. And if you want a close look at the dish feed horn, look, here's our cantenna with its dipole, quarter wavelength uh, feed element and so on. And that's what's inside the feed horn of the, of the antenna, okay? And let's see, I think I've got one more slide. And I just like to, you know, the ultimate big, in this case, uh, this, is, this is the Arecibo dish in, uh, in Puerto Rico, which unfortunately this year suffered its demise um, due to uh, uh, many years of uh, poor maintenance and so on. And, uh, if you want to know what BFD stands for, it's big and dish, and you can figure out the middle letter for yourself. Okay, questions. Uh, and I know I've gone a lot longer than what uh, we were expecting, but uh, so I, have I apologize a for that. So I have a question. What do you know about fractal antennas? Um, I know that they're very much in controversy. 
as to whether they're real or whether it's just a uh, uh, dipole that's folded around on itself. And beyond that, I haven't studied them. Any, uh, any other questions that I can? There were uh, Kate, questions in the comments. I'm not sure whether they all got answered or not. Oh, okay. Let me uh, figure out how to bring up the, uh, oh, there, there's the chat window. Okay. How far back do I need to go? This, this sounds like a lot of fun. How about if we uh, try to challenge ourselves to make some of these antennas? For the I ugly, con uh, ugly, ugly un antenna contest. That's a good idea. I actually plan to make one if I can, uh, if I can find the time and ambition to do so. Um, and uh, it's one that uh, I didn't talk about in my presentation, so I'm keeping it as a secret for now. I put it into the chat, but I had a friend who used the cantenna and he got his Wi-Fi out to the shop in his backyard by having a can on each end and pointed them at each other and it gave him enough gain. He was able to push it to the backyard easily. And then he just used a, a hotspot or a, um, a, re a repeater, a, a Wi-Fi repeater in the, in the shop. That's a good use of it. Yep. I, I appreciated your discussion of fan dipoles and, and the different configurations. When I was in the, the Air Force, we had a an antenna. We called it an orthogonal antenna. And I, I never was quite sure how it worked, but then I saw your presentation there tonight and uh, it all made perfect sense. Uh, it's a great antenna, one of my favorite antennas to use ever. I, I wish I could get my hands on one, but uh, uh, maybe I could just build my own. I've got a, I've got a bunch of uh, links here of various videos and, and online resources. I'm going to take those and post and, uh, um, and paste them into the, uh, uh, into the chat when we get, uh, when we get done here. But with that, I think I'll uh, turn it back over to Noji and Trevor and uh, apologize for taking more time than uh, more of you guys' time than uh, I probably was supposed to. You're on mute, so Noji. Thanks, appreciate that. And uh, Keith, wow, what a presentation. This is so cool. and. Um, I mean, you know, you apologize, but I, I think I could listen to this probably for another couple of hours. Of course, then I'll start falling asleep just because I'm getting full of um, Reese's peanut butter cups here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks to Trevor for feeding me. Anyway, what, a, what an awesome presentation, Keith. And we've got so many compliments in the chat. People are coming on one by one saying, uh, this is fascinating. This is ter terrific. This is a wonderful presentation. So. Uh, very big, big kudos to you, Keith. Thank you so much for all your time and preparation and work. And, you know, you're, you're a great presenter. We appreciate you a lot. So thanks for that. Um, I think that um, Jim had a question on there. Jim, did you have a question? Uh, who is that? You, you, Jim, did you have a question? Oh, no. I, I was going to say about that log periodic uh one with all the <laughs> units on there, where at the front of the log uh, periodic, you, you had the little short antennas, and then of course the, the uh, reflectors in the back. Well, uh, years ago, I experimented with one of those, and I built one that w was two of those, but they were at uh, angles at each other from the mast, uh, 45 degrees, where the short antennas, if you will, were t almost touching each other, but on the back end, they were uh, the boom was at an angle. In other words, if you could see me on the screen, they went this way, and the other one went 
down. And uh, it so, really picked up. As a matter of fact, up in Seattle, see, it had so many hills that it was hard to pick up some of the signals from uh, Queen Anne Hill in Seattle. And boy, when I put that thing on, it really worked. So it may be, you know, if you could adjust it for amateur frequencies, it might be worth uh, trying again. I may try to do that sometime. Thanks okay. a lot for a great presentation. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, thank you there, Jim and, and others. Appreciate you coming on. And, and once again, thanks to Keith. Well, we do have to move on for sure. And we, before we close out this, um, this uh, meeting tonight, we're going to turn the time over to Brent for his time in his show. So Brent, uh, go ahead and take it over. Just understand that we are short on time. So do your best. Okay. Okay. Um, well, yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, tonight's door prizes um, for the first one, two, three, four, five prizes are in this order. A nut driver set. You probably can't see this, right? No, I actually thought. What Noji is holding there is the nut driver set. And then we have the club light stick. That looks like something my mom used to spank me with. Yeah. Signal stick antenna. You know what that is. Yes. And then we have the ARRL annual membership. And then we have a work light. Yeah. So we'll start with those prizes and then we will work our way to the two main prizes. Winner of the first prize. By the way, as you are chosen, you can pick one of the prizes. Okay, make sure I got it run in. Here we go. 4919 K7LSH, Lynn Hancock. Four nine one nine, Lynn Hancock. Do I pick another? Are you on there, Lynn? Lynn Lynn's not with us tonight. All right, pick another. Oh, let's try this one. One four three seven, W one Y M I Reed Dixon. He's there. Yeah. All right, Reed. You awake? Yep, I'm awake. Yeah, all right, what's the nut? I'll take the nut drivers. All right, nut driver it is. Thank you so much. And no, Jerry, are you writing this down or do I need to write stuff down? No, uh, I'm writing it down, but you know, I, I lose my papers. So you feel free to write it down too. Okay. <laughs> You can email it back to me. So congratulations, Reed. Okay. Sorry, I missed W one. W one Y. It's a question. Why am I? Okay. All right, here we go. Dose. Chase Palmer, 1512, KJ70XM. OXM, Chase. OXM. Right, Chase. I'm, here. OXM. I'm here. I just had to turn off two different mutes. Um, I'll take the AWRL, the whatever that membership. <laughs> yeah, that is a huge <laughs> tongue twister. You got it. Congratulations, Chase. All right. Okay, third prize. Five 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 W W seven GTB Doug Boson. Well, thank you. I'll hey, take the closet light. Okay. <laughs> the, the bud light. I mean, the club light. The okay, bud light. 
right. It shall be delivered. The Bud Light or the Club Light? I can only take the Club Light, so I guess it better just be that. Ah, oh, darn. All right. Prize number four. Diane Clough, 1980, KV7 A&E. Say hi. Hi. Hey, Diane. Congrats. Oh, look, you called on me. So I was fixing dinner for my sister who's visiting from California. Hey, I'm coming over for dinner. This is good. Nature as so Diane, you still have the signal stick? Then we can just the signal stick. And she's got the work light and the signal stick, is that right? I want the signal stick. Okay, got it. Okay, so now we just have the work light left. Whoever wins this prize gets the work light. Thank you. You are Good welcome, work, Diane. Diane. Congratulations. And I'll see you in about 10 minutes for dinner. Okay, and winner of the light is Ogden Mills, 5-4-9-er-9-er, -er, K-7, O-G-D. He's on YouTube. Ogden's here, he's on YouTube. Okay, Ogden gets the uh, work light. And uh, there we go. Congratulations, Ogden. You can hear me on YouTube. Okay. So let's move on to the two main prizes. Um, let's start with the Pluckerus J-Pole antenna. And that's, this that's, one includes the installation. Well, that's that's the grand prize. We'll save that for last. So the, oh, the fully programmed radio is the, okay. So I take that back. We are going to start with the fully programmed TYT THUV88 handheld radio. Did I mention that this radio is fully programmed? I believe you did. And the winner <laughs> of this fully programmed handheld radio is Dan Gale, one, two, three, four, N7RRY. All right, Dan, where do you go? Oh, great. Is that, is that radio programmed? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. Um, so Dan, are is, you with us? Is Dan, yeah, can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Very good. Congratulations, Dan. Oh, hey, thanks. I'll deliver it to you. Okay, thanks, Noji. You know, if you don't want it, I'd, I'd be more than happy to take it off your hands. It's no trouble at all. Okay, now for the main prize this evening. I was I was joking, by the way. The main prize for this evening is the Pockers J-Pole Antenna. And it includes the installation of said antenna. Okay, I'm gonna do that one again. It's having a hard time loading here. Okay, Mike, Mike Baxter, 4343 WN7 UHO. Congratulations, Mike. Are you on? Mike's not on YouTube, is he? Wait, 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 wait. Hi, Mike. You got five seconds. Claim your oh, prize. That's not the Mike Baxter from uh, Last Man Standing fame, is it? His twin brother. That's it. Uh, All right, well. Sorry, Mike, you gotta be here to win. All right, uh, here we go. I, now I happen to know that Mike has one on his roof, so you know, there's no, no big loss for him. So go ahead, Brent. All right, the new winner of this Puckers J Pole antenna is Dan Gale, N7RRY. You just gave him a prize. Oh, I'll, why did he come up again? That's weird. Okay, now I'm gonna reload the page. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Are we allowing more than one prize per person? I mean, okay, know. the new winner is sure. not Trevor Holyoke, <laughs> but Scott Armstrong, WS7RJT1864. Interesting. He won one too previously. All right, Scott, are you on? Mr. Scott. 
What was his call sign again? W S seven R J T Whiskey Sierra seven. Yeah, I don't see him in Zoom. Okay. Oh, uh, Scott, two down. Okay, here we go. Third, third one is the lightning round. I have to know that Scott has one in his room too. So, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> is Lauren Chandler four nine eight five one K E. Lauren, congratulations. She said she's here. She's in the chat room. All right. Congratulations, Lauren. You are the winner of the Potter's J-Poll. Yeah, he says in the chat that he can't audio right now, but he's there. I don't believe it. I got to hear this guy. You there, Lauren? <laughs> he is. He was making jokes about not being able to ride a bicycle earlier. <laughs> All right. Very good. Works for me. Well, thank you, Brent. Appreciate it very much all your work and, and all good stuff. All well, right. thank you guys for all your work and congratulations on those who won prizes. And Trevor, right. it looks like your luck, your streak ran out. That's okay, I've already got a day full. There you go. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, um, uh, before we close out, is there anything else anyone wants to bring up tonight? Um, any last, last words? Final words before we shut down. Um, somebody did mention something in the chat about something Ogden was doing. Um, yeah, um, Ogden Mills. Uh, no, the Ogden Club. Oh, Ogden Club. Uh, let's see. Okay, stand by. We're looking up something that was mentioned in the chat. Um, the Ogden Club will be at the Golden Spike event this weekend, sending out 100 year anniversary. Uh, QSL cards. Awesome, awesome. All right, this is from Ken. Yeah, so uh, Ken, we can't hear you if you're trying to talk. Yeah, go ahead, unmute. You feel free to jump in there, Ken. You're still muted. <laughs> well, all right. Oh, well. All right, we can't hear you, Ken, but uh, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, well, we'll pass that on and we'll see if we can get that uh, posted on Facebook or somewhere else. All right, guys, thank you very much. Uh, the meeting, I guess, is adjourned. Is that what they say? Anyway, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you guys again next month, June, whatever date on June that turns out to be, first Thursday then. And please invite your friends, your relatives, anybody else that you might like or don't like. You're welcome. June 3rd, there we go, is our next meeting. So until then, 7-3 to all. Thanks for joining us tonight.